Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video is a short introductory extract from William Wynne Westcott's 1911 work Numbers, Their Occult Power and Mystic Virtues. I remember reading this book ooh, 20 or 30 years ago, so this is very much a refresher for me, as it may well be for you. If you enjoy this presentation, let me know in the comments, because there's a lot in the work that I think could make interesting videos downstream. I'll wait for some feedback to see if people are interested. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy Numbers, Their Occult Power and Mystic Virtues, Pythagoras, His Tenets and His Followers. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. Pythagoras, one of the greatest philosophers of ancient Europe, was the son of Nisarchus, an engraver. He was born about the year 580 BC, either at Samos, an island in the Aegean Sea, or, as some say, at Sidon in Phoenicia. Very little is known of his early life beyond the fact that he won prizes for feats of agility at the Olympic Games. Having attained manhood, and feeling dissatisfied with the amount of knowledge to be gained at home, he left his native land and spent many years in travel, visiting, in turn, most of the great centres of learning. History narrates that his pilgrimage in search of wisdom extended to Egypt, Hindustan, Persia, Crete and Palestine, and that he gathered from each country fresh stores of information and succeeded in becoming well acquainted with the esoteric wisdom as well as with the popular exoteric knowledge of each. He returned with his mind well stored and his judgment matured to his home, intending to open there a college of learning, but this he found to be impracticable owing to the opposition of its turbulent ruler Polycrates. Failing in this design, he migrated to Cretona, a noted city in Magna Graecia, which was a colony founded by Dorians on the south coast of Italy. It was here that this ever-famous philosopher founded his college or society of students, which became known all over the civilised world as the Central Assembly of the Learned of Europe. And here it was, in secret conclave, that Pythagoras taught that occult wisdom which he had gathered from the gymnophysists and Brahmins of India, from the Hierophants of Egypt, from the Oracle at Delphi, the Idean Cave, and from the Kabbalah of the Hebrew Rabbis and the Chaldean Magi. For nearly 40 years he taught his pupils and exhibited his wonderful powers. But an end was put to his institution, and he himself was forced to flee from the city owing to a conspiracy and rebellion which arose on account of a quarrel between the people of Cretona and the inhabitants of Sybaris. He succeeded in reaching Metapontum, where he is said to have died about the year 500 BC. Among the ancient authors from whom we derive our knowledge of the life and doctrines of Pythagoras and his successors, the following are notable. 450 BC, Herodotus, who speaks of the mysteries of the Pythagoreans as similar to those of Orpheus. 394 BC, Archytas of Tarentum, who left a fragment upon Pythagorean arithmetic. 380 BC, Theon of Smyrna. 370 BC, Philolaus, from three books of this author, it is believed that Plato compiled his book Timaeus. He was probably the first who committed to writing the doctrines of Pythagoras. 322 BC, Aristotle. Refer to his Metaphysics, Moralia Magna and Nicomachean Ethics. 
276 BC, Aristosthenes, author of a work entitled Cochinon, or Cribrum, a sieve to separate prime from composite numbers. 40 BC, Cicero. Refer to his works De Finibus and De Natura Deorum. 50 AD, Nicomachus of Geresa, Treatises on Arithmetic and Harmony. 300 AD, Porphyry of Tyre, a great philosopher, sometimes named in Syriac, Melic, or King. He was the pupil of Longinus and Plotinus. 340 AD, Jamblichus wrote De Mysterius, De Vita Pythagorica, The Arithmetic of Nicomachus of Geresa, and The Theological Properties of Numbers. 450 AD, Proclus, in his commentary on the works and days of Hesiod, gives information concerning the Pythagorean view of numbers. 560 AD, Simplicius of Sicilia, a contemporary of Justinian. 850 AD, Photius of Constantinople has left a bibliotheca of the ideas of the older philosophers. Coming down to more recent times, the following authors should be consulted. Johannes Mercius of 1620, Marcus Mybomius, 1650, and Athanasius Kircher in 1660. They collected and epitomized all that was extant of previous authors concerning the doctrines of the Pythagoreans. The first eminent follower of Pythagoras was Aristius, who married Theano, the widow of his master. Next followed Nisarchus, the son of Pythagoras, and later Balagoras, Titus, and Diodorus the Aspendian. After the original school was dispersed, the chief instructors became Clinius and Philolaus at Heraclea, Theorides and Eurytus at Metapontum, and Architas, the sage of Tarentum. The school of Pythagoras had several peculiar characteristics. Every new member was obliged to pass a period of five years in contemplation in perfect silence. The members held everything in common and rejected animal food. They were believers in the doctrines of metempsychosis and were inspired with an ardent and implicit faith in their founder and teacher. So much did the element of faith into their training that autos effa, he said it, was to them complete proof. Intense fraternal affection between pupils was also a marked feature of the school. Hence their saying, my friend is my other self, which has become a byword to this day. The teaching was in great measure secret and certain studies and knowledge were allotted to each class and grade of instruction. Merit and ability alone suffice to enable anyone to pass to the higher classes and to a knowledge of the more recondite mysteries. No person was permitted to commit to writing any tenet or secret doctrine, and, so far as is known, no pupil ever broke the rule until after his death and the dispersion of the school. We are, thus, entirely dependent on the scraps of information which have been handed down to us from his successors and from his and their critics. A considerable amount of uncertainty, therefore, is inseparable from any consideration of the real doctrines of Pythagoras himself. But we are on surer ground when we investigate the opinions of his followers. It is recorded that his instruction to his followers was formulated into two great divisions, the science of numbers and the theory of magnitude. The former division included two branches, arithmetic and musical harmony. The latter was further subdivided into the consideration of magnitude at rest, geometry, 
and magnitude in motion, astronomy. The most striking peculiarities of his doctrine are dependent on the mathematical conceptions, numerical ideas and impersonations upon which his philosophy was founded. The principles governing numbers were supposed to be the principles of all real existences, and as numbers are the primary constitu constituents of mathematical quantities, and at the same time present many analogies to various realities, it was further inferred that the elements of numbers were the elements of the realities. To Pythagoras himself, it is believed that the natives of Europe owe the first teaching of the properties of numbers, of the principles of music and of physics. But there is evidence that he had visited Central Asia, and there had acquired the mathematical ideas which form the basis of his doctrine. The modes of thought introduced by Pythagoras and followed by his successor Jamblichus and others became known later on by the titles of the Italian school or the Doric school. The followers of Pythagoras delivered their knowledge to pupils fitted by selection and training to receive it in secret, but to others by numerical and mathematical names and notions. Hence, they called forms numbers, a point the monad, a line the dyad, a superficies the triad, and a solid the tetrad. Intuitive knowledge was referred to the monad type. Reason and causation was referred to the dyad type. Imagination, form, or rupa was referred to the triad type and sensation of material objects was referred to the tetrad type. Indeed, they referred to every object, planet, man, idea and essence, to some number or other in a way which to most moderns must seem curious and mystical in the highest degree. The numerals of Pythagoras, says Porphyry, who lived about 300 AD, were hieroglyphic symbols by means whereof he explained all ideas concerning the nature of things. And the same method of explaining the secrets of nature is once again being insisted upon in the new revelation of the secret doctrine by H. P. Blavatsky. Numbers are a key to the ancient views of cosmogony in its broad sense, spiritually as well as physically considered and to the evolution of the present human race. All systems of religious mysticism are based upon numerals. The sacredness of numbers begins with the great first cause, the one, and ends only with the naught or zero, symbol of the infinite and boundless universe. Tradition narrates that the students of the Pythagorean school at first classed as exoterosci, or osculantes, listeners, were privileged to rise by merit and ability to the higher grades of genuini, perfecti, mathematici, or the most coveted title, esoterici. <laughs>